Hello. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to today's uh, Youth Talks, Young Scientists Shaping the Future. My name is Wei Li. Uh, I'm a faculty member and a light PI at uh, GPL Photonics Laboratory at SIEM, Chinese Academy of Sciences. Myself is working on thermal photonics, so I'm extremely excited to introduce the experts who will be sharing their perspectives in thermal photonics today. So today we will have Professor Jody Mandel from Princeton, Professor Ivan Latella from University of Barcelona, and myself as speakers. Um, uh, we will also have Professor Lin Zhou from Nanjing University joining us in, in the panel discussion after we finish the talks. So I'm super excited to hear both the talks and the panel discussion where we will discuss the futures and challenges in thermal photonics. So I'd like to start by introducing our first speaker, Professor Ivan uh, Latella. Professor Ivan Latella is a lecturer in the Department of Condensed Matter Physics at the University of Barcelona. He obtained his PhD in physics from the University of Barcelona in 2016, and his PhD thesis received an extraordinary doctoral thesis award. Uh, he was a postdoc researcher at the laboratory Charles Fabry Institute of Optics, uh, in France in 2016, 2017, and during 2022, he was also a postdoc fellow at the uh, University of Sherbrooke, Canada in 2017 to 2019. In 2019, he joined the Department of Condensed Matter Physics at the University of Barcelona as a postdoc, and in 2020, he was already the uh, Marie Curie Individual Fellowship to be carried out in the same department. Uh, since 2014, he is a member of the organizing committee of the SIEGE Conference on Statistical Mechanics. So his research uh, mainly focuses on thermal photonics, developing theoretical and numerical methods based on fluctuation electrodynamics uh, to describe nanoscale relative heat transfer in many body systems. Within his, this field, his interest encompasses thermionics, energy conversion, thermal photonic effects in non hermitian systems. His activity also centers in the thermodynamics and statistical mechanics of non related systems, including small systems and systems with long range interactions. So, today we are very happy to have him today. Uh, and the title of his talk is Thermal Management and Energy Conversion with Near Field Thermal Radiation. So, the stage is yours, Evan. Uh, very excited to hear your talks. Thank you very much for the nice introduction, Way. Should I share yeah, the screen, yeah, right? Share your slide. Mm. Great. Working? Yeah. OK, thank you very much for the introduction, as I said, uh, and for inviting me to present my work here. Thank you, Wade. Thank you, the organization. And uh, well, I guess I'm going to speak about thermal management and energy conversion with uh, near field thermal radiation. We are involved in this. Uh, yeah, this is basically my research. And then uh, first, just to start, I would like to mention uh, what is uh, near field thermal radiation. We we all know have the, the notion of uh, thermal radiation, for instance, coming from the sun. Eh? This is uh, uh, thermal radiation, of course, but uh, there is a big difference in which um, the objects are large, let's say, and separated by large distances, and when they are uh, in the nanoscale. Yes. Uh, not only the sun is a source of uh, thermal radiation, any hot object can radiate. Uh, this thermal radiation uh, is due to uh, random movements of charges inside the material, and then this emits uh, electromagnetic uh, waves that are dissipated in a distant body, and then this constitutes a mechanism for energy transfer without contact. Then. In the, in the, at the nanoscale, when we reduce the separation distances, in addition to the usual propagating waves from one body to the other, there is also a contribution uh, from uh, modes, emanescent modes that are confined very close to the surfaces of, of the bodies. 
And then uh, this uh, evanescent uh, field at the end also contribute to the energy exchange in such a way that when we reduce the separation distances, as you see in this in this fig in this figure uh, below uh, uh, at a few nanometers, the heat exchange in between objects can be uh, much much lar larger than uh, the, the the limit we have for uh, objects separated by a large distance, uh, which is the black body limit. Yeah? So at the nanoscale, heat exchange is very intense and depends also on the optical properties of the materials, in particular, for instance, uh, materials, uh, polar materials like uh, uh, silica have a, a very intense uh, uh, contribution to the heat exchange eh? because of uh, some particular optical properties. So this is I will focus on thermal management and energy conversion in this domain eh, at the nanoscale. So we we have this contribution from near field thermal radiation. Then the the, the first point I would like to to discuss and introduce is uh, the concept of a radiative uh, thermal diodes. Eh, we all know the diodes in electronics eh, that uh, the, the main uh, property is that they they conduce they, they, they led to a current only in uh, in a given uh, direction imposed by the the voltage. Eh? We impose a voltage to the diode, and then they conduce in one direction, but not in the reverse or in the forward. So here we can have uh, an analogous of uh, an electronic diode, but uh, in the uh, with heat instead of of uh, electricity. So you know, instead of having a current of uh, Electricity, we have a current of heat, eh? and instead of having electrons flowing from one body to the other, in this case, since we focus on thermal radiation, what we have are photons eh? traveling from one body to the other. Then we can introduce this uh, 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 radiative uh, diode and consider this, eh? for instance, to 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 implement uh, thermal management if we want to. Induce some directionality in the in the direction of, of the heat fluxes in, for instance, in, in a in a device, uh, whatever the, the the implementation it has. For instance, in electronic circuits, eh, we would like to if we we might have to to conduce some cold heat, and then uh, thermal diodes also are are important. And then uh, there exists this uh, this effect. It has been introduced a few years ago. And then, in which uh, in these uh, thermal diodes, what we have is a temperature difference. Imagine you have one with a hot temperature and the other one with a cold temperature. This is uh, in red and in blue. And then you have a heat flux, but here it is called GF, flowing from one body to the other. And then, when you change the temperature, there should be a, also a heat flux eh, in this backward. Uh, situation in which you exchange uh, the temperatures, and then uh, the, the the point is that you will have a diode or a, a rectification effect if these two fluxes are not the same eh, in the in the in the two scenarios. And then this uh, because, for instance, in the stream case, we would like to have something that only conduce when you have uh, a. a, a, a and impose temperature difference, but when you exchange the temp temperatures in the uh, ideal situation, we will uh, want to have something which is uh, zero. Eh? So we will have a flux only in one of these uh, scenarios. And then this can be um, uh, realized if we consider materials uh, with a temperature difference in the optical properties. Uh, this is the usual mechanism, uh, which which uh, there has been a lot of work on that, on that. But it's a necessary condition to have a temperature dependence on the optical properties. Uh, in particular, uh, one can have a high rectification coefficients. This rectification coefficient eta here simply means the the ability of the to rectify. It means which when it is one, it means that. You have only uh, flux in one di direction, and if it is zero, it means that 
in the two situations is the same flag, so actually it, it is not working. So a good diode should have a rectification coefficient close to one. And uh, uh, this can be achieved, for instance, uh, by considering materials with a very important uh, dependence on the temperature, I mean, the, the optical properties, such as, uh, for instance, vanadium dioxide, which is a material that has a, a, a phase uh, change uh, a phase transition eh, it changes from uh, insulator to, to to metallic behavior, and then uh, these transitions induce a, um, a very a strong dependence on the optical properties on, on the temperature. And then, with that, it's, 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 it's a possibility of introducing these diodes by considering this material. But uh, the, it has a well. The, the detail is that you have to work; you are forced to work around the temperature. Of the phase transition to in order to make this diode to work, and then uh, uh, because in particular, the, if there is no optical properties, uh, if there is no dependence on the optical properties uh, on the temperature, there is no rectification, and then you have to work around this uh, phase transition. Another possibility is considering uh, uh, this is what we have uh, been working on uh, a situation in which. One can allow uh, uh, an asymmetry just by considering uh, uh, an additional degree of freedom by, by considering an intermediate body in which is a passive body. So we just play an intermediate body. We don't set the, te the temperature and anything. Uh, so it is passive. And then you, you might induce with this body an asymmetry in the uh, heat exchange in between the, 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 the three bodies, eh? in between the three objects. So with that, it's another possibility to induce rectification and to have a, a radiative diodes in the, in the near field. Eh? And uh, I will not uh, go in too much in the details. This diode also might work, uh, work even if optical properties do not depend on temperature. So this, Introduce a big advantage. Eh? We um, might have these objects to manage the directionality of heat fluxes, even if the materials do not depend too much on temperature. So, if you neglect uh, the, this dependence with these configurations, you might uh, obtain rectification. Eh? For instance, this, uh, this is uh, an example by considering two uh, uh, configuration like that with two different materials. You still need the, the, the asymmetry materials. And then here in this example, I consider uh, very different materials from the optical point of view in the infrared, eh, which is a polar material, a PN and a metal. And with that, you can uh, achieve uh, rectifications close to uh, 0 0.5. It's not so high as with uh, uh, phase change uh, materials, but at the end, uh, it has the, the advantage that you can design it to work over a broad temperature range and you are not limited by the, the temperature of the uh, phase uh, transition. So this this was one of the, the points I, I wanted to, to share regarding uh, thermal management, eh? how to induce directionality in the in the heat fluxes, in the in the heat in our system by considering, for instance, a, a diode. Uh, there could be also one can imagine also a radiative uh, transistor. I'm not speaking about uh, about that, but uh, this also. It, it can be realized also by using materials with a phase change. Uh, now I will uh, will change. Uh, I will focus on a different effect. I will now consider uh, energy conversion, uh, a device for energy conversion. That is, that is we have thermal sources, uh, heat that is uh, some coal, for instance, uh, lost as uh, waste heat eh, because bodies are hot and then lose heat and then we might uh, imagine a situation in which we can try to convert this uh, lost energy into a useful energy by using some uh, conversion mechanism. A uh, well-known mechanism for energy conversion using thermal radiation is called a photovoltaic cell. Eh? We all know that from the sun, we can convert this energy into electricity by using the cells, and this can be implemented also 
this kind of uh, cells, nano nanoscopic cells, can be implemented in the, in the, at the nanoscale with uh, near field thermal radiation. But I will focus on a different uh, uh, mechanism today, uh, which is uh, also interesting. And then at the end, I will compare. I will focus on the pyroelectric effect, uh, how to convert, uh, how to get useful energy using the pyroelectric effect from thermal radiation. The idea is that uh, the pyroelectric effect, just to, to give a brief uh, explanation of this uh, effect, is that uh, due to the structure of the materials, without going into the details, uh, uh, the intrinsic polarization of the crystals uh, can uh, change with the temperature. Uh? Basically, for instance, this happens in ferroelectric materials that have uh, pure electricity. And, uh, uh, and the point is that if one induce a variation of the temperature with respect to time, so if we allow the, the temperature of the body to change with respect to time, then at the end, the polarization will change with respect to time. And then at the end, if you connect on the on the material uh, a circuit, then we, you will you will get, you will collect a, an electric current. Eh? And this is the, the pyroelectric effect. Basically, the, the, what you need is to induce a change of the temperature in the material. Okay, uh, a mechanism to, to use pyroelectric, uh, a pyroelectric uh, system with near field thermal radiation can be, has been introduced a few years ago by this group, Fang and co-workers. Co uh, they have a very interesting, and the idea is that imagine that um, you have two uh, hot and a cold body at a fixed temperature, and then uh, in the middle we put a pyroelectric material. This uh, blue, uh, this uh, yellow um, uh, layer here represents a pyroelectric material. And then, as I when I started the the discussion, I mentioned that uh, in the near field thermal radiation and energy fluxes depend on the separation distance. So actually, if you move this body in the middle closer to the to the hot body, this this intermediate body will tend to heat up. Eh? And if you move it uh, close to the cold body, it will tend to uh, cool down. So actually, one can induce a variation, a temporal variation of the temperature of the pyroelectric material just by using a mechanical system, for instance, piezoelectric attractors or whatever mechanical means, and then in such a way that if the one have a, one has a, an oscillation in the separation, then at the end the heat transfer will oscillate also, and this will induce a, an oscillation in the temperature of the body. So with that, you will have a pyroelectric effect. And then this pyroelectric eff effect uh, gives you uh, electricity from thermal radiation. And then actually in this the system, the, the, the advantage, well, uh, actually uh, you can convert this energy, but it has some, some limitations, is that uh, you cannot reach very short separation distances at which the heat flux is, is very intense, it will be very high. You cannot reach these separations because there are restriction forces in between the bodies, this which is called the Casimir force, that will tend to stick the the bodies one to the other, and then you will not be able to move it. I mean, to control uh, very uh, the separation distance at very short separation distance in this mechanical fashion, then you will need a required, in principle, a lot of energy, and uh, too much energy more than the pyroelectric uh, that the one you can get from the pyroelectric uh, system. So at the end, is is not a, a conversion system because uh, you will get less than what you put. Uh, so it is a limitation in separations in this uh, regard. Uh, but uh, anyway, uh, Fang and Go workers they show that this works at least if you have uh, uh, at, uh, at a separation distances at about uh, 100 nanometers, and you can do this modulation because of the limitation just at about five hertz. Eh? We would like to have a uh, high frequency in the modulation because at the end the power you will get from the pyroelectric uh, device. Is proportional to the frequency. It's proportional because uh, uh, once you perform uh, an oscillation, 
you, what you are doing is kind of a thermodynamic cycle in the in the period, and then for each oscillation of the temperature, you will get a given uh, energy, uh, which is a property of the material. And then, if you do this cycle, uh, the, the, the higher the number of cycles you perform per unit time, at the end, the higher the power you will get. So we need not only variations of the temperature, but uh, we need to do it at high temperature, at uh, high frequencies. And then a possibility, this is what we have uh, proposed, is to consider instead of having a mechanical system that with moving parts, uh, we, we we introduce a, a, a system which is a solid state uh, system, which everything is fixed here. And then the way to control the heat fluxes and the temperature of this uh, periodic material here in the middle, what you have is a periodic material. Uh, what we use is uh, uh, graphene sheets. Uh, one can uh, basically a graphene. This uh, uh, we we consider a graphene sheet on top of the hot and cold bodies, as you see it here. This basically this what you see the, these uh, hot and cold bodies are uh, graphene transistors. Eh? So we exploit this this uh, field effect transistor in graphene to control the the, the heat fluxes. Basically, uh, if you modulate the gate voltages. On the graphene transistors, with that you can control the optical properties of the graphene, and then you can control the heat exchange. So modulation, uh, modulation of gate voltages leads to uh, an oscillation in the heat transfer and also uh, an oscillation in the temperature. And then with that you have a pure electric effect. Uh, and this is what we have uh, considered. Actually, uh, this this works at uh, at frequencies at about uh, one kilohertz, so uh, much, much faster than uh, mechanical systems. Right? With fixed separation distances, that is an example I'm considering here, it is about uh, 20 nanometers. The idea, just to understand a little bit what is behind uh, the, the, the behavior of how graphene can be used to control heat fluxes, uh, is, uh, is as follows. Uh, this, these plots you see here are the so-called transmission coefficients of uh, heat exchange in between two bodies, for instance, the hot body and the intermediate body. These heat transfer co uh, coefficients, these heat transmission coefficients are shown here in the frequency, in the vertical axis, and, and the, uh, as a function of the wave vector in the horizontal axis of the electromagnetic radiation eh, that they are exchanging. And the uh, bright uh, points in this plot represent that you, for this particular frequency and wave vector, you have a good transmission. So the brighter the, the plot, the, the transmission, and then the higher the, the energy flux. And then here in this plot, uh, uh, the, the transmission coefficient you see on the top, eh, you see two resonances, these two peaks, that corresponds to silica because we cover the, the bodies with the silica, and then these are so called uh, surface form polariton resonances of silica. Basically, uh, here uh, the voltage on graphene is zero, so it plays no role, and what you see is only the effect of silica. But then, when you apply the voltage on graphene, uh, uh, you can excite, uh, you excite a plasmon, and this plasmon in graphene. Uh, basically interferes with the phonon polariton of silica and destroys the, the coupling in between the silica layers, as you see here on the uh, bottom panel. So these, uh, these two resonances get distorted and actually uh, attenuate. Because, uh, as, as you can see, the, the brighter region here is smaller than in the previous one. So uh, this uh, basically switch the the transmission and then with that you have actually a, a radiative thermal switch. So the graphene sheets by applying a voltage on graphene, you are switching off the the heat exchange in between the bodies. Then basically this is a, a radiative switch, and with which you can couple and decouple the pyrectic material from the hot and from the uh, cold body. And then with that this 
you might uh, you do the same operation on the two on the two reservoirs on the hot and the cold reservoir and then you will get more or less the same situation and then with that you can tune on these uh, graphene uh, voltages to control the heat exchange and then the temperature at the end you can induce a temperature oscillation of the periodic material and then with that uh, you can exploit the periodic effect here in this plot for instance i'm showing uh, in, in these oscillations of the temperature, I'm showing the maximum temperature you get in an oscillation, this red curve here, and the minimum temperature you get in an oscillation here as a function of the frequency. As you can see, by fixing the voltage and uh, changing the frequency, you will get a, a given variation of the temperature. And this one, I, I show this picture here because it's the one we need to uh, for a particular material I'm going to consider now, uh, a pyroelectric material, and then with that we can build our pyroelectric uh, system uh, with considering these variations of temperature. And as you can see, uh, the, there is an important temperature variation. In this case, it is 10 uh, kelvins at around a frequency of uh, one kilohertz. So, for instance, now I'm going to consider uh, uh, a device in which the periodic material is uh, this one, 09 PM, 01 PT, which is a relaxer, a relaxer ferroelectric. I don't want to go into the details, but what we know from this material is that uh, it has an energy density that uh, is is known. Eh? Is known. People here in this work they estimate this energy density. So. We know the energy density the, the, that can be delivered by the directory material, and then we can also know uh, or compute the power uh, that we need to control the graphing sheets. Yeah? So with that, we can uh, estimate the total power output uh, need uh, delivered by the device. It's just uh, the difference in which uh, the difference in between what you get from the pyrrhectic material uh, and then you su subtract what you need to control the, the graphene sheets. And then with that, at the end, you can get a power from this, uh, for this pyrrhectic system as a function of the frequency. And then you see that actually it works at frequencies which are about uh, one kilohertz. And now is uh, this quantity, this power is not uh, too much uh, meaningful uh, to put it in context. We can compare it, for instance, uh, with what we might get by considering a, a, a nanoscopic version, let's say, of a photovoltaic cell. Uh, photovoltaic cells, that uh, a very important property of the cell is the the energy gap, and eh, if we use semiconductors, so as a function of the of this energy gap, you might get a uh, given power or, or a different one. And then here, what I am comparing is the power uh, the power you get using uh, the pyroelectric material I considered before, just this point here, and then uh, using the pyroelectric the the thermophotovoltaic cell, eh? this one in green is for INSP, and this in blue is for INES, which have a different uh, bang up and then at the end, uh, different uh, power output. Because uh, the main drawback of the problem that uh, have these cells in the, at the nanoscale is that the thermal emission from hot sources is uh, in the infrared. And eh? these cells work very well in the in the far field, for instance, with the solar radiation, because radiation is in the visible, and then these cells capture very well the solar radiation in the visible range of frequencies. But uh, there is a problem in the in the infrared because uh, most of photons radiated by the sources are lost. Eh? The, the the material is not able to produce electricity because they have no enough uh, energy. So, and then uh, this is this considering a pyroelectric material would be a possibility, a possibility, an alternative to these um, uh, thermophotovoltaic cells in the near field 
that might be a possibility. Eh? So it's a different mechanism to consider to get to exploit uh, thermal radiation and to produce energy conversion. So basically, this is uh, what I wanted to, to mention. I would like to conclude now. I, I consider, I discuss a little bit on uh, rectification, that is thermal diodes, and then uh, I show that we might have a rectification even without uh, temperature dependence on the on -the properties by considering these uh, three body systems with an intermediate uh, layer. And then the, the advantage is that these rectifiers do not require the use of phase change materials and can be designed to operate over a growth uh, temperature range. And then I also discuss, uh, uh, introduce a mechanism for energy conversion, I consider a pyroelectric uh, system based on graphene that can be used uh, uh, for energy harvesting from stationary thermal sources at kilohertz frequencies. And this device is a self-powered device because the energy you get is obviously larger than what you need to put uh, to control the graphene sheets. And in particular, uh, by making a, a comparison, it's at least uh, or better than conventional uh, thermophotovoltaic cells. So with that, I'm, I'm finishing. Let me uh, thank uh, collaborators that have been involved in this work. First, Philippe Benabdala from Institute of TIC in France. Also, uh, Moladak uh, Nikbarak in the University of Sanjan in Iran, and Spend Age Diaz from uh, Germany at the University of Oldham. So, also, let me thank uh, Fundings, University of Barcelona, and the European Commission. Thank you very much. With that, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Ivan, for this uh, for your wonderful talk. Uh, I enjoyed it very much and also learned a lot. Uh, as uh, you do, uh, so, uh, as, uh, so we uh, so let's see if we have any questions. So I don't uh, haven't seen any questions in the chat. So let me uh, perhaps ask the first question. Uh, so you, uh, in your talk, you give this uh, uh, describe this system, uh, this parallelic uh, energy harvester, which uh, has the potential to be uh, better than the typical. Uh, uh, TPV or using this uh, PV cell uh, configuration. Uh, so uh, my, uh, I'm, I'm wondering is this is on, uh, so this advantage or this performance, uh, better performance, uh, is this specific to near field or uh, in the far field, if one imagine to do a similar kind of configuration, will it also have a, a better uh, performance? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, well, not sure in far field, for instance, in far field you cannot use uh, graphene in principle because you need to be, to to excite the platform, you, you need to be a very small separation distances, but mm -hmm. uh, different mechanisms can be used in order to, uh, what, what you need is to uh, induce a temperature variation with respect to time. Uh, if temperature of the object changes with respect to time, then at the end you will get the periodic effect. In fact, field is uh, complicated. In particular, there is no dependent with the separation distance of the of the situation. So, but uh, probably is a, a good uh, direction to to investigate. Uh, All right. Thank you. Uh, so uh, uh, we have. Uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, so, yeah, uh, Jordi, please. I stop sharing, right? Um, I had a quick question regarding the, the boron uh, nitride and metal structure that you showed in uh, one of your earlier slides. Yes. Uh, could, you, um, uh, uh, could you please elaborate on uh, how it functions again uh, for my benefit? Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, basically, um, the, the point is that, is that with two, uh, with just with two bodies, uh, you, you need necessarily a dependence on temperature of the optical properties. Okay. There, with this structure, um, maybe I was too fast, uh, but uh, first, you have an asymmetry in the materials. 
That is why I consider two very different materials. And uh, by allowing the, by having this intermediate body, which also is a V layer, the, the V layer is, uh, you are not required to put a V layer in the middle, but uh, uh, we take this V layer in order to, to have uh, an optimum uh, temperature in the stationary state, eh? because we put the bo this body there, but do nothing, it's purely passive. So we impose temperature difference in the hot, in the cold bodies, and then the intermediate body will reach a stationary state. We do nothing. Then we consider the V layer because the, this stationary temperature, which is an important quantity here because it's the additional freedom you have uh, uh, in this three body system, uh, uh, so reaches the, the good value in such a way that you get rectification. So it's very important what is the the, the temperature of this stationary body. And then basically it works because of uh, this additional freedom you have by considering a third body. Okay, great. Uh, so uh, in the interest of time, we will save more questions to, uh, in the panel discussion session. So, uh, all right, uh, so let's move to our next speaker. Thank you so much, Ivan, for your wonderful talk. Uh, we'll be bringing you back in the panel discussion. So now uh, uh, we are very excited uh, to introduce Professor Jody Mandel from Princeton. Professor Mandel is an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering in Princeton University uh, and an associate faculty at Princeton Material Institute. He earned his PhD in applied physics from Columbia in 2019 and was subsequently uh, was a Schmidt Science Fellowship uh, in University of California, Los Angeles. Dr. Mendel's research involves understanding and controlling nano to micro scale radiative heat flows in both natural environments and artificial surfaces, with characterizing and mitigating ambient heat in warming world as a guiding theme. On the scientific front, uh, his work lies at the intersection of optics, material sciences, uh, and involves the creation of photonic and plasmodic metamaterials and designs with novel optical properties. On the civil and environmental engineering front, his designs, uh, he designs scalable materials that relatively thermally regulate and make a human environments more sustainable and climate resilient. Uh, Dr. Mandel's other research interests include optical component design uh, for infrared heat detection and characterization water harvesting using passive cooling technologies, uh, modeling large-scale impact of radiative cooling designs for geoengineering and optical and radiative phenomena in the natural world. So today we will discuss radiative cooling of objects using the space as a heat sink. So now the floor is yours, uh, Jordi, and we are looking forward to your talk. All right, uh, I think you, uh, uh, okay. okay, all right. Uh, as you can see my screen now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, so thank you, Wei, for the, the very kind introduction. Um, I'd like to start by thanking the ICANX organizers for the very kind invitation to share my work with you. And to the audience, uh, good evening, and thank you for joining me. Uh, the title of my talk is Radiative Cooling of Terrestrial Objects Using the Space as a Heat Sink. Um, but before I go into the details, I want to start with a quick overview of my broader interests and motivations. Um, so by way of introduction, I come from an applied physics and materials background, and my research involves the study and control of thermal radiation, that is the solar to far infrared wavelengths, and their interactions with both natural environments like trees and the atmosphere and artificial surfaces, all the way from nanostructured materials, as you can see here, to large-scale building envelopes. So this is quite an interdisciplinary area that involves a bit of optics and material science, a bit of radiative heat transfer, and atmospheric and building sciences. And today we'll see how these are all connected. The work in my lab and my career so far primarily involves creating optical materials, but at Princeton, my home is in the civil and environmental engineering department. Uh, this is because a major motivation and a guiding theme of my work is mitigating and adapting to heat in a warming world. 
as we know, the temperatures are rising around us. And cities, which already host a majority of the world's population and suffer from heat island effects, urgently need cooling. As a result, the need for active cooling methods like air conditioners has exploded as seen in places like China and increasingly in India. But air conditioners are not really a sustainable solution to this problem because of their cost, their energy usage, their CO2 emissions, and most importantly, because of the fact that they are heat pumps that simply move heat from indoors to outdoors and generate their own heat in the process. So that they actually exacerbate the cooling problem. So as cooling buildings and cities emerges as a grand engineering challenge of our times, we urgently need sustainable solutions that are passive and with a net cooling effect. One promising solution to this challenge, um, and the part of my research that I'll talk about today, is cooling using the sky. The idea is this, the atmosphere is transparent in certain wavelengths of light, which we call windows. One exists in the visible which is the reason why we can see, take photos, and have sunlight reaching us from space and heating things up. There is another window called the long wave infrared or the 8 to 13 micrometer thermal window, which is very important for two reasons. Firstly, it spans the wavelengths in which everyday objects radiate heat. And secondly, because of the atmosphere's transparency, this thermal window reveals the ultimate heat sink, the cold outer space. So objects on Earth can radiate heat through this window to space, bypassing the greenhouse effect, and reach low temperatures. So now we have an understanding based on atmospheric science. So what can we do? If we can design a surface that is highly reflective in the solar wavelengths, say 95% or more, then the incoming sunlight gets reflected back to space. But achieving a high solar reflectance across the entire spectrum is a challenge. What is more, the surface needs to transition to a low reflectance or a high emittance in the long wave window so that it can efficiently radiate heat to space. But if we can do both, then solar heating is outweighed by long wave heat loss. And the surface, known as a radiative cooler, can spontaneously lose around 100 watt per meter square of heat to space, even under the noontime sun, and cool to 5 to 10 degrees Celsius below the ambient air temperature. Crucially, this happens without any energy usage or CO2 emissions. And because heat is lost from Earth to space, it has a unique net cooling effect on the environment. So needless to say, this is very attractive as cooling living environments become increasingly urgent in the backdrop of climate change. So naturally, this has attracted a lot of attention from researchers for a while. Uh, however, as I mentioned before, achieving a high solar reflection and high thermal emission is challenging. For a long time, radiative cooling was only possible at night, with pioneers like Hett, Trombe, and the other names mentioned here leading the way. But that changed in 2014, when the first design to show radiative cooling under strong sunlight, a photonic stack, was reported by researchers at Stanford University. Subsequently, researchers have used concepts from the world of photonics, optical metamaterials, and phase change materials to develop sophisticated and high-performance radiative coolers. And as time has passed, we have seen notable advances in both scalability and design functionality. My colleague, Dr. Whaley, uh, who is a speaker here, actually worked a little bit on the area as well. Um, so since this is the thermal photonic stock, I want to briefly talk about one of my earlier works, uh, which I think will lay the foundation on the material side of things. So this work was done when I was a PhD student, and as someone who's new to the radiative cooling field, <coughs> I asked myself, where can radiative coolers be most meaningful? To me, the answer was cooling roofs of buildings because we spend most of our time indoors. But this is a challenge. Roofs are rough surfaces come in elaborate designs in different socioeconomic settings and are exposed to different weathers. But as probably all of us here know, one design that goes very well on roofs are paints. Now, paints are very applicable and scalable. But because of their material composition, even the best white paints absorb sunlight and are not able to cool when sunlight is strong. So unfortunately, they are not really good for radiative cooling during the day. So the question for me was, can we make a radiative cooler that has the same capability as state-of-the-art photonic designs or metamaterials, 
but has the applicability of pains. So the idea we used to solve this challenge was to use a very common material, polymers. In this particular case, an example called PVDF. So polymers like PVDF are transparent to sunlight, but because of their vibrational modes of their chemical bonds, they intrinsically absorb and radiate heat in the thermal window of the atmosphere, as you can see from the complex refractive index in this graph. Now, what I did was use a process that is widely used in the membrane industry, known as phase inversion, to make the polymer porous. I'll skip the details here for now, but as you can see, it is a solution based design which can be applied like a paint and dries in minutes to give a highly porous coating. And upon close inspection, the pores are hierarchical with both nano and micro pores. And these micro and nano pores together scatter all wavelengths of sunlight very well without any absorption, leading to a high solar reflectance. In the longer wavelengths, however, they have an opposite impact. The micro pores on the surface offer a graded refractive index, and the nano pores, being much smaller than the long wavelengths, make the polymer a low index effective medium. So the combined anti-reflective effect of this is to reduce the reflectance relative to the bulk shown in blue and increase the emittance shown in red here. And together, the solar and the thermal effects mean that uh, what we get as, as, as a result of this paintable process is a coating that can have a near-perfect solar reflectance of up to 98% and a thermal emittance of 97% in the long wave window, almost like a black body. And this leads to a very good cooling performance. Uh, to show this, we left our coatings completely exposed to the elements in Phoenix, which is a desert environment. And even under fairly strong sunlight of 900 watt per meter square, the coating cooled to 6 degrees Celsius below the ambient air temperature. Promisingly, the hotter and drier the weather, the better the cooling. So in places like the Middle East, we can get even greater temperature reductions. In independent models done by building uh, energy modelers, this design has been shown to be capable of doubling energy savings in buildings relative to typical white paints and reducing carbon dioxide emissions in buildings by hundreds of kilograms to several tons per year. And urban modelers have shown that this design could potentially cool urban temperatures by up to 3 degrees Celsius. But most importantly, this is a highly scalable design. So currently, this material is being commercialized. So I thought I'd to give you an idea of the scale that this material can be deployed in. I thought I'd show you a photo that shows uh, an installation that currently has the paint, the paintable meta material applied on. So we now have a paintable, uh, super white and super emissive uh, polymeric meta material that is highly scalable for use on buildings. So far, so good. But this brings us to our next challenge. So far, what, whenever I have talked about radiative cooling, I have talked about surfaces that face the sky. In other words, roofs. However, a significant fraction of building surfaces are vertical walls and windows, which makes things much trickier. And this is because walls and windows not only see the cold sky, but also the earth, which not only covers more half or more of the field of view, but radiates a lot of heat in the sun. And here, the thermal emittance of radiative coolers becomes problematic because good emitters of heat are also good absorbers, meaning that they are heated by the ground. So the realization at my end was that the atmosphere here plays a subtle but very unhelpful role. These graphs show how. So this is the heat radiated by a perfect thermal emitter at ambient air temperature. So you can imagine this as the heat radiated by the surface of a building. Now, towards the sky, the atmosphere is kilometers thick and very opaque. So it radiates the same amount of heat downwards to the emitter and no net heat loss occurs outside the atmospheric window. In the atmospheric window, because the atmosphere is transparent and has the cold space beyond it, its heat drops. It does not radiate much heat. So you can see the drop here. And the difference between the, the emitter and the atmosphere shown in blue is the heat loss that can happen to the sky through the thermal window. And as you can see here, because of the atmosphere's thickness towards space, it is narrow band. 
it occurs only in the wind. But the atmosphere between the building and the warm earth is thin. So it is transparent to heat flow in pretty much all wavelengths. So the heat from the ground actually occurs in all wavelengths. And when you look at the heat gain shown in red here versus the heat loss, you can easily see that the red negates or dominates the blue, meaning that instead of cooling, we get heating by radiative coolers. And this is important because designs that are reported for buildings so far are all broadband absorbers and emitters, whether we are talking about asphalt, wood, concrete, paint, or even the super white paints or composites or thermochromic windows that have been reported recently. So while they are good for roofs, these designs may suffer from broadband heating in the sun, making them unhelpful when it comes to vertical facades. But the solution to this problem is inherent in the atmospheric bias that we just saw. Since skywards heat loss is narrowband and terrestrial heat gain in the summer is broadband, if we can use a selective emitter that restricts heat flow only to the long wave or thermal window, then we can filter out much of the broadband heat gain as shown here without really cutting down on the blue heat loss. So this enables a large relative cooling effect. In fact, it does more. During the winter, when the ground becomes cold, it becomes a broadband heat sink for warm buildings. The selective emitter in that case prevents broadband heat loss. So purely owing to the natural seasonal variation, we get a novel and seasonal passive thermoregulation effect that goes beyond cooling. To my knowledge, we are the first to report this mechanism, which is static and very different from thermal re electrochromic designs and represents a new way to thermoregulate buildings. So how significant is this? Well, using our understanding and theory, we can compare the difference between the selective and the broadband emitter shown on top here. So the, the broadband emitter sees the broadband heat and as well as the narrowband heat loss, whereas the selective emitter just sees the, the part within the, the window. And we can plot the difference of these two cases as a function of ambient air temperature shown in the x-axis here and the ground temperature relative to it. And as we can see, during harsh summer days, when the air is hot and the ground is even hotter, the selective emitter has a relative cooling of around 40 watt per meter square. And in winter nights, when the air is cold and the ground even colder, it can achieve a relative heating of 10 to 15 watts per meter square. To give you a feeling of these values, an LED light bulb spends around 20 watts of energy. So these values are actually quite significant. In terms of temperatures, a selective emitter can stay up to 3 degrees Celsius cooler on harsh summer days, a significant value which diminishes and starts to reverse in the winter. So the, the, the theory seems good, but does it actually happen in real life? To validate this, we performed a number of experiments in warm and cold conditions in the US. As a selective emitter, we used polymethylpentane, which was shown in the 1970s to be a good selective emitter. As you can see, it has a high emission in the long wave window shown in blue here and a low emission outside. As our broadband emitter, we used PVDF, which was the same material we showed in the work, previous work on paints. So none of these are quite perfectly broadband or perfectly selective, as you can see by comparing the two cases, but they're good enough. So we took our samples, uh, put them on styrofoam, and placed the setup on a roof uh, that had a warm pool, as shown here. And we did this experiment on the winter night. At first, we made our samples face vertically uh, the, the rooftop, which had cooled to 5 degrees Celsius below the ambient temperature overnight. And with the cold grounded view, which was cooler than the air around it, the selective emitter was warmer, just as our theory predicted. Then we moved our samples to face the pool, which was maintained at a warmer temperature. So it's 11 degrees Celsius warmer than the ambient air. So everything else, the ambient temperature, the atmosphere, everything else was the same. Only now, the ground or the pool was warm to mimic a summer morning. And within five or so minutes, the selective emitter had become cooler than the broadband, conclusively showing the passive thermoregulation that our theory predicted. 
So we did more experiments during both summer days and winter nights on streets and on roofs. And as you can see, during the summer, the PMP selective emitter uh, stays cooler and in the winter, it stays warmer. And in the seven or so experiments that we did across seasons and locations, our results were all consistent with the theory, which lends strong support to the thermal regulation mechanism it proposes. So these results have major implications for buildings. We incorporated our atmospheric and radiative heat transfer theory into a building energy model and simulated what would happen if we replaced traditional broadband building envelopes with selective emitters. We looked at insulated walls in the US, single layer brick walls, which are common in South Asia, single pane glass, and corrugated metal sheets, which are used as walls in resource poor settings. And for all four of these cases, we simulated what would happen if we put selective emitters instead of broadband uh, emitters in both summer and winter and in desert and tropical conditions. And what we find is that the selective emitter saves energy in both summer and winter, and particularly for materials used in developing country settings. To give some context, the energy savings when you, that you get when you paint black roofs white is shown using the dotted lines. And they correspond to roughly 200 kilograms of CO2 emissions reductions per year and $60 uh, savings for small builders, small houses. By comparison, the savings from using the selective emitters are comparable or several times larger. And the most important thing is, these are calculated on a per unit area basis, which means when you consider the roof to wall area ratios for tall buildings, the savings are even more. For multi-storied apartment buildings, this selective emission approach could cut annual CO2 emissions by a few tons or more and saves hundreds of dollars, hundreds of dollars of um, um, cost, perhaps as much as thousand dollars. So both of these values are quite significant. And in resource poor settings, our approach may reduce seasonal indoor temperature fluctuations to bring thermal comfort and reduce health risks associated with heat waves or cold waves. And the best thing is that these benefits that I talk about are all complementary to those of painting walls or roofs white. And this savings that we mentioned, this mechanism is completely untapped and new. So given the promise of our approach, we explored how we could foreseeably implement these on buildings, particularly in resource poor settings. So my goal was not necessarily on novelty, but rather on common, but perhaps unexplored materials. So this led to several scalable designs, some of them novel and some of them known, which could be conveniently applied in walls and windows. So here are three examples. On the novel end, we showed a ceramic tile design that can reflect wide bands of radiation without any metal backings. So this is a selective emitter that achieves the selective emittance without using any metal. So to our knowledge, this is the first time this has been reported. And it takes advantage of the, the restaurant bands as well as scattering effects to achieve the selective eminence. We also showed on a more traditional note, uh, if we can make thin enough layers of acrylic on metal, we can get a selective emitter as shown here. And given that acrylic is widely used in paints, this is very promising in terms of scalability and cost. But the one example that excites me the most is polypropylene because it represents a novel insight into a material that is so common that it's almost mundane. So I discovered that polypropylene is an exceptionally good selective emitter when I was studying waste plastics out of curiosity. The spectrum that you see here is the lid from a lid of a container of chips. So here, the selectivity of the polypropylene arises from the molecular structure. The presence of carbon to carbon, carbon to hydrogen, and CH2 and other vibration modes gives it a selective emission within the long wave infrared window. And the spectrum that you see here is completely unoptimized. As I said before, it was taken from a piece of waste plastic. But as I showed earlier in the, if, the uh, on my uh, work on paints, there are industrial processes and insights from the photonics and optics world and processes like phase inversion that can be used to make this highly structured, for example, micro nanoporous, to enhance both its solar reflectance and selective thermal emittance. And it can be made into many different forms, transparent or white films, metallized sheets, fabrics, you name it. 
And this is really exciting because the selectivity and the performance comes from the second most commonly used plastic in the world, which is made at a greater than 1 billion um, uh, meter square per year scale, probably much more than that. And it is already so common that it can be readily sourced from plastic waste. It is quite likely that you have polypropylene films and sheets in your home, school, or office. So what all of this means is that selective emitters, which can thermoregulate buildings, are actually well within our reach. We could potentially paint them onto buildings, apply them as tiles or claddings, or put them as films or on windows. And given that they're already available for other uses and made at scale, this expands their potential impact, especially in resource poor settings. And what I've shown here from a broader sustainability standpoint, it also opens up a really exciting possibility of recycling and extending the life cycles of plastics and using them to make photonic coatings that can thermoregulate buildings. So in summary, what this work shows is a novel and passive thermoregulation effect, which arises from atmospheric bias and seasonal variations in the terrestrial environment. And based on our understanding of the ambient radiation, we use selective emitters that can harness a thermoregulation effect in, wall, in wall, walls and windows of buildings. So we introduce this new insight. Uh, we show how we can harness it. We experimentally validate it and show a range of materials that can be applied on buildings to harness this effect, including the very common polypropylene in a very new way. And using building energy models show that the resulting building energy savings and emissions reductions can be very significant. Excitingly, this possibility is very much untapped, and I, as such, I believe that this work marks a major advance in radiative cooling and building design, and I'd say that it actually opens up a new subfield for vertical surfaces with promising avenues for designing selective emitters not only for buildings, but also in other areas. A major application of this design could be for cooling vehicles and aeroplanes that are exposed to hot terrestrial environments. Another major area of application could be textiles. Recently, we have seen some major advancements on cooling textiles in the literature. However, these designs are also effectively broadband, which means that when exposed to a hot environment, they may have a heating rather than cooling impact. So our design, uh, which uses selective emitters, offers a fundamental advance in this regard and can enable better thermal regulation for both humans, vehicles, and uh, buildings as well. And it, uh, uh, from a thermal photonics perspective, it also motivates the design of highly selective emitters. As you can see, even though polypropene is one of the best selective emitters known to us owing to its uh, material properties, it is still quite far from being the ideal emitter, which is shown in red. So can we optically engineer polypropene to enhance its selectivity? Or can we design new materials, new polymers or ceramics from scratch? So these are more fundamental questions. Uh, that I'm excited to explore, but I hope the presentation convinces you that these have very practical implications. So where does this leave us? Uh, we now have a super white broadband emissive paintable metamaterial for roofs and selective emitters that can thermoregulate walls and windows. But there are a lot other more considerations that remain, both on the optical and material science front and on the civil and environmental engineering front. So since um, I've moved more to the civil side, I want to raise, end uh, by raising one issue here that I think is very important for material scientists and optical uh, scientists to consider. And it concerns the question, are dynamic and adaptive radiative coolers a sustainable co cooling solution at a time of climate change? But before I go into the details, I want to briefly describe what dynamic or adaptive radiative coolers are. So one problem with radiative coolers is that they cool buildings in all seasons. So in the winter, they have an overcooling effect. So we have to burn fuel in our homes to keep buildings warm. This costs money, and because we are burning fuel, it also leads to carbon dioxide emissions. Adaptive or dynamic radiative coolers, on the other hand, behave like normal radiative coolers in the summer. That is to say they have a high solar reflectance and a high thermal emitter. However, in the winter, they switch to a low solar reflectance that is black or transparent, or as shown in this graph, they switch to a low thermal emittance mode. This means no overcooling in the winter and no building heating penalties. So this is probably the hottest topic in the radiative cooling field right now, with multiple works in very high-profile journals in recent years. 
there are many types of designs some examples include electrochromic fluidic or thermochromic designs that can be switched between cooling and heating modes so this design for instance works based on vanadium oxide which we have heard of in the previous talk so these designs are without a doubt uh, good for buildings however their impact on buildings uh, on the environment may be maybe more complicated and it has to do with the fact that okay so let me just step back a little bit again to recap so traditional radiated coolers lose heat all the time as a result they overcool buildings so you have to heat buildings using fossil fuels and the co2 goes out into the the environment and it causes greenhouse effect or with adaptive radiative coolers that is not the case you don't radiate as much heat in the winter because it switches to a solar heating or a low emittance mode so the the heat stays within the building or like you know it's not radiated outwards and you don't have to burn as much fuel so it's good for the environment as well but this benefit um, comes at the cost of replacing a part of the earth surface that was previously radiating heat to space now that it is a low emittance mode or a dark mode it no longer has a net heat loss to space so essentially radiative compared to a radiative cooler you have impacted the radiation budget of the earth in a negative way so when we compare these two effects so one is the the greenhouse gas reductions we can do building energy modeling that shows us that the per meter square of the radiative cooler or the adaptive radiative cooler using an adaptive radiative cooler can save around 1 watt per uh, meter square of uh, heat so we don't have to uh, so the atmosphere does not have as much co2 because we are burning less fuel so we trap less heat in the atmosphere and that's roughly 1 watt per meter square of emitter but the the fact that we have a design now that is no longer radiating heat means that we are losing out on heat loss directly from the earth to space by up to 50 to 100 watt per meter square so this value is actually much larger than the 1 watt per meter square gain uh, in uh, like you know in the uh, uh, reduction of greenhouse effect so it might actually be better in a way to have the radiative cooler on the building traditional radiative cooler on the building and keep burning fossil fuels because overall the cooling impact on earth is even more so like you know as 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 a material scientist or optical scientist i think it is important for us to think about broader impacts and environmental sustainability of our design as well so this is very much an open question we still need to figure out which of these effects dominate but based on that it can inform what kind of designs we make in the future so now uh, so i have in this talk so in summary i have basically described to you a super white paint for cooling roofs a long wave emitter for th seasonally thermoregulating vertical surfaces like walls and windows and i have also raised some environmental considerations that i'd encourage you to think about um, as we make more and more efficient designs for buildings and the environment in the future so i'd like to end by thanking the people whose support and mentorship has made this presentation possible in particular my uh, phd advisor professor yuan yang my postdoctoral advisor professor ashwat ram and my collaborator at columbia professor nan fang um i'm very grateful to them for their support um i'd also like to say that like you know our group is uh, uh, has open positions for visiting scientists as well as postdocs and phd's um more details are available on my website but please feel free to email me if you're interested uh, with that um i'd like to 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 end here um uh, and uh, if you have any questions i'd be uh, uh, very happy to take them and once again thank you very much for for uh, listening great uh thank you so much for your wonderful talk jordi i enjoyed it uh, very much and uh, especially uh when you where the part you discussed uh, the uh, the the environmental considerations of whether we should use uh 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 switchable radiative coolers or not so that's uh very interesting uh, and i just want to add up uh, for those of you who are in the audience and who are interested in the positions uh please contact jordi and this is a uh, very great opportunities to join uh, this uh, uh, wonderful group and uh, the wonderful university uh, uh, so uh, 
I also actually realized that my email address here is still my old email address, uh, but you can <laughs> uh, free to uh, contact me in my Princeton email address if, if that helps. But uh, thank you. Right, the the, uh, the the new email at uh, Princeton, right? Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. Well, we may open up uh, maybe one question and then uh, save other questions uh, in later in in the in the panel uh, discussion session. So, uh, uh, if we don't. Uh, uh, just maybe one question, a quick question here is: uh, 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 when uh, when you do this uh, selective e emitter, um, uh, you you show that this material it can be transparent or highly reflect uh, reflective. Uh, so uh, uh, because you mentioned that this material itself is uh, forming uh, a uh, sort of like can uh, doing cooling uh, in the summer and doing heating in the winter. Uh, right. Uh, so, in the, in your last part of the calculations, is this uh, already taken into account, or uh, or the, those are the separate uh, done in the separate uh, considerations? So the the building energy models uh, that show these um, uh, these uh, the charts that I show here. Sorry. These, uh, so we basically designed our own building energy model with the help of colleagues on the building energy side. And uh, we, uh, like, you know, essentially just treated uh, ambient radiation and how it, like, you know, behaves, uh, like, broadband and selective nature of the, the ambient heat flows. And what happens mm -hmm. when you put these various types of selective emitters. So this mm -hmm. is very much, um, like, you know, uh, um, these considerations of like you know selectivity are baked into the building energy model so it, it does adequately represent it in my view yes okay yeah. and but in the in the very last uh, calculations where you discuss this environmental considerations uh was that in that kind of calculations was this uh, uh, uh selective emitters uh, also uh taken into account um not yet uh, so we are that is something that that we are working on right now uh, mm -hmm. uh, it's a, this is a new idea that like I thought I'd share with you because I think it's really important for material scientists to think about what mm -hmm. kind of designs they're making. Because the problem is the main thing. So, uh, okay. but yeah, that is something that we are, we are working on in the uh, right now. Great. All right. Uh, so in the interest of time, then we'll save all the questions uh, later in, in the panel discussion. And uh, uh, we'll see you back in, in the... Uh, in the panel discussion. Thank you very much, Jyoti, uh, again, for your wonderful talk. Uh, so, uh, uh, all right, uh, so uh, uh, this is uh, the time that, that I will uh, give uh, the, the next talk. Um, so let me share my uh, screen. Hopefully it's... Uh, Uh, hopefully you can see my screen. Is it uh, looking all right? Uh, can you see my shared yes. uh, screen? Uh, we see the presenter mode. Sorry. A presenter mode. Oh, uh, is it the yes. right way? Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So this is a perfect time where I pick up uh, the, the my presentation because it's a. Uh, the pre our previous two speakers, Evan and Jordi, have already gave very nice uh, introductions uh, and discussions about uh, different aspects of thermal radiation. So I just want to maybe add up a few uh, perspectives uh, uh, thinking about controlling thermal radiation for energy applications. Uh, as our two previous two speakers already uh, gave uh, the uh, describe, uh, description of thermal radiation. So I just want to, uh, to do a quick recap, uh, but a, a key uh, message I want to deliver here is that really by using a sub-wavelength or wavelength scale shaping, uh, for example, using nanostructures like gradients, meta surfaces, meta materials, photonic crystals, or using this uh, like a near field uh, gap with the uh, characteristic scale length scales uh, smaller than wavelength scales, we can really uh, shape or reshape uh, the typical thermal radiation, which is typically a uh, black body thermal radiation, into something that's uh, quite different. For example, uh, spatially uh, selective, polarization selective, or uh, angular uh, selective thermal emission. And that really uh, leads to uh, interesting applications such as TPV, uh, as uh, Ivan have already described, uh, or radiative cooling, as Jordi described, uh, as, as well as many other applications such as lighting and 
uh, many, many other in interested things. So uh, one of the interesting implications, as I already, already discussed, is this uh, radiative cooling. Um, as, we, uh, as we learned from the, the last talk, is that if we have the ability to tune or control the thermal emissivity, in particular in this wavelength uh, transparency window of atmosphere in the A230 microphone, uh, and in the same time, if, I, if we have the ability to significantly uh, reduce the solar absorption in the solar wavelength range, uh, when as a, uh, in doing so, we will have the ability to have a net uh, outgoing heat flow uh, flowing through this atmosphere to the outer space uh, where, we, where we, our incoming heat flow will be significantly reduced. And in doing so, we are doing a net cooling, uh, which is can lead to a uh, daytime radiative cooling even uh, in the uh, in the daytime right so uh, since uh, the initial work of daytime radiative cooling in 2014 by uh, professor Shen Hui Fan and Ashras Raman uh, later this field has really expanded and a lot of exciting breakthroughs in this uh, in this field uh, including the works uh, many uh, uh, many inspiring uh, materials innovation including the work by Jody Mandel and many other colleagues as well as the clever design in thinking about the thermal design and to really to push the performance of radiative cooling. And those advances that really lead to uh, many applications of radiative cooling, uh, such as cooling water and combining with air conditioning systems uh, to harvest water uh, from the air uh, by using these cooled surfaces. And also to put uh, radiative cooling into textiles, as Jody discussed uh, in, uh, in his talk, as well as to um, combine radiative cooling uh, with uh, colored surfaces, as, uh, and to think about also to think about radiative cooling or utilizing the heat sink of the cold space uh, in the thermodynamic point of view for energy harvesting consideration. So, since already already have uh, gave a very nice uh, uh, discussion on radiative cooling on many aspects. So today, uh, my talk will focus on uh, these two parts. Uh, one will discuss uh, the, the colored uh, surfaces, how we can do the thermal management uh, on the colored surfaces, and the other side, I will talk about uh, the thermodynamic consequences and energy harvesting using the heat sink or using radiative cooling. Right, so uh, let's look at this uh, colored object first. Uh, why would we care about this? Uh, this is really from a practical consideration point of view, uh, because if we look at our typical uh, outdoor scenarios, such as buildings, cars, clothing, uh, those colors, uh, they are typically, uh, some of them are white, but most of them are not white, all right? Uh, and those colors are typically fixed uh, first, uh, either for functional or aesthetic reasons, all right? So, uh, so therefore, being able to uh, preserve the color or uh, doing thermal management without affecting the color is very important. Uh, so uh, one question we have to ask is uh, how much we can change uh, this uh, relative thermal load uh, for a given color. Uh, to answer that question, we have to examine what are the available uh, 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 mechanisms or what are the available approaches we can do uh, to do this. So uh, as we have already discussed the radiative cooling, now imagine if we have the ability to tune or control the thermal emissivity in the thermal em uh, emission wavelength range, uh, say that we can from zero to one, when uh, then we will have the ability to turn on or turn off the radiative cooling. And that will lead to us a uh, heat load difference or cooling power difference from zero to 130 watts per meter squared, all right? So, uh, and because this wavelength range, uh, typically the thermal emission from four to 30 micron is far away from the visible wavelength range where uh, our eyes can sense the color and the light. We have the independent, uh, independent knob to tune the heat load without changing the color, right? So that gives us the first mechanism. Now, if we further move to uh, shorter wavelengths, if we look at the solar spectrum here, uh, we also notice that there's a, a huge portion of the solar spectrum that sits outside the uh, visible wavelength range. And this is typically referred as a near infrared solar absorption. Again, if we have the ability to turn on or off the absorption in this wavelength range, we have the ability to control the heat load with a range from zero to uh, 450 watts per meter square. 
And again, because this wavelength is outside the visible wavelength range, uh, that gives us the second mechanism to tune the uh, heat load without changing the color. Now, finally, if we move to the visible wavelength range, and this is a very interesting wavelength range where our human eye can sense a, uh, sense a light and sense a color, and in the same time, is the absorption or the reflection of the surfaces also affects the heat load. And why it's called visible is because our human eye can sense the light here. Uh, uh, but if we look at closely uh, to our human eye structures, uh, we can immediately realize that our eyes are not a perfect spectrometer. Uh, instead, it only have three color sensors, right? Uh, uh, namely, uh, short, medium, or long uh, sensors spanning in the wavelength uh, range, uh, or typically referred as RGB three color sensors, right? So that actually leads us to a very interesting uh, physiologically uh, or not physical effect called a metamerism. Uh, and one not notable example I can give you is that um, uh, our human eye uh, can, in some cases, cannot distinguish a pure yellow light or a properly mixture of a green uh, and a red light, right? So uh, with that uh, metamerism effect, uh, in, in principle, we can have two surfaces with the same color, uh, but very different uh, solar absorptivity properties in the visible wavelength range, and that will lead to a heat load difference. Theoretically, can go up to 250 watts per meter square. And if you remember the relative cooling number, that's 130 watts per meter square, this number is already quite large comparable to relative cooling. All right, now, uh, if we combine this metamerism with near infrared solar absorption and the relative cooling, uh, theoretically, we can have two surfaces with the same color, but their heat load uh, we can theoretically have a tunable range over 800 watts per meter square. Uh, this is a, actually quite a large number. If you recall, for the total heat, solar heat flux is around 1,000 watts per meter square. So this number is actually not small, right? Uh, and now, uh, if we put this kind of colorful surfaces into uh, imagine in uh, actual outdoor conditions and look at how does this heat load affect the temperature, uh, we realize that this. Uh, uh, in typical outdoor condition, many colors uh, can actually have a temperature range uh, that spans up to 70 degrees Celsius. And interestingly, for some lighter color, for example, uh, light blue color shown here, in some cases can be over 60 degrees Celsius hotter than the dark blue color. And in some extreme case, a pure white color can be over 30 degrees uh, hotter than the pure black color, uh, which highlights the potential of tuning the uh, thermal properties of the surfaces, but without uh, changing the color. Now, with that calculation in mind, uh, we, as a proof of concept demonstration, a few years ago, we, de this, uh, we designed and fabricated those two surfaces, uh, two thermal photonic structures. Uh, one is called hot, and one is called uh, cold structures. Uh, both looks the same, a similar pink color, uh, but as we'll show you in the next few slides, they will have very different thermal properties. So uh, if we look at uh, the thermal uh, emission wavelength range, uh, we'll see that the cold structure uh, showing on the right will have a broadband strong thermal emissivity uh, in this uh, 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 relative cooling uh, wavelength range. And this high emissivity is coming from the photon polarity resonance from the silicon dioxide building in these material layers, right? Uh, on the other hand, uh, the hot structure we will have uh, this significantly reduced emissivity. Uh, and this is due to we use a chromium, which is a, essentially an infrared reflective metal that can surprise uh, the emissivity in the infrared. Now, if we move to the solar spectrum here, uh, the cold structure have a very strongly uh, reduced uh, uh, solar absorption, especially in the near infrared. And that is due to in the structure, we use construct this silicon, silicon dioxide multi-layer bright reflector uh, to block the near infrared sunlight. But on the other, other hand, the hot structure uh, due to this chromium, silicon dioxide chromium dielectric metal cavity that can su support a strong cavity resonance here that, that will lead to a very high near infrared uh, solar absorption. And in the, in the end, the, uh, if we move to the visible wavelength range, oh, we will have these uh, two structures having the same color, 
but they will have very different reflectivity or absorptivity uh, absorption spectrum. And that will lead to a, a heat load difference of about 100 watts meter square. Combining with the uh, uh, near, near infrared solar absorption and the uh, uh, radiative cooling, we can have those two structures with the same color, but the heat difference of uh, nearly 500 watts per meter square. So what does that number mean? So if we put those two structures in the outdoor uh, test, we can see that those two surfaces can reach a, a temperature difference of over 47 degrees Celsius. And interestingly, if we compare this uh, to a commercially available paint with a similar color, they can be either uh, over 20 degrees hotter or colder uh, than this paint. And also interestingly, uh, our hot structure, even though it looks like a light pink uh, structure, uh, a surface, it, is, it can still be over 10 degrees hotter uh, than the darkest black paint that you can buy uh, on the market, which really highlights some uh, interesting uh, potential that we can do this, uh, 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 do this uh, uh, thermal management uh, but without affecting the color. And uh, uh, recently, there, there, I know there, there have been uh, many other groups are also doing similar work, and including President Mandel have uh, uh, a very nice work using the paint and other structures to doing uh, this kind of things. So uh, this is great. Uh, however, uh, if we uh, look at carefully uh, so this results, and uh, we realize that if we look at this cold structure uh, temperature here, even though we call it cold, all right, uh, but if we compare it uh, to the ambient temperature, uh, we realize that it's actually uh, not really doing cooling, right? Because the temperature here is still higher than the ambient. Uh, so the question then is, can we actually do net cooling uh, for these colored uh, surfaces? Now, to answer this question, we have to go back our calculations and see uh, whether there's really a possibility or potential. Now, uh, if, uh, here I plot the different uh, uh, the heat load range, uh, considering all three mechanisms we have considered for a wide range of different colors. We, we realize that, that only for those very bright colors, like white or near white colors with very strong reflectivity, the uh, minimum heat load can go, to, uh, be, can go uh, below zero, which is doing cooling. For like a black color, darker color, or other colors, the minimum heat load is all above zero. And this is uh, even in this, if we consider all the colors in the lightness range, this is already picking from a lightness of 60, which is a relatively light color. For those darker colors, it is even uh, uh, impossible to do so. Therefore, we have to think about uh, uh, additional mechanisms to, do net, uh, to uh, achieve net cooling uh, for color surfaces. And that brings us to think about uh, the mechanism of photon energy conversion. Now, uh, if we think about a uh, surface as we've shown here, uh, it will, uh, to create color, it has to absorb some of the, these uh, photons in the visible wavelength range. However, if we have the uh, uh, approach to convert uh, part of this absorbed uh, photon energy into a lower uh, wavelength range and re-emit some of these photons, then we have the ability to recycle some of these photons and send the heat out and reduce the net heating. All right. So with this mechanism here, and co collaborating with Professor Jia Zhu's group at Nanjing University, uh, my postdoc, uh, Chen, Qi, uh, Chen Qijin, did these uh, uh, calculations and shown that it is theoretically uh, it's possible that uh, uh, for color surfaces, uh, we can reach uh, sub-ambient cooling, provided that we have a high efficiency, a high efficient photon energy conversion process. Okay. So uh, with this uh, calculation, uh, uh, keep in mind, uh, uh, my team member, uh, Dr. Chen Qijin, collaborating with Professor Jia Zhu's group at Nanjing University, uh, we have, uh, in the past few years, we have uh, made experimental efforts towards uh, this line. So the starting point is really a uh, daytime radiative cooler, which looks purely white here, right? And uh, uh, how we do it is we use uh, construct this randomly stacked uh, uh, nanofibers, which where we design as this uh, as nanofiber diameters comparable to the solar wavelength range and which have a, a strong scattering efficiency. And by randomly scat scattering the, and using this electrostatic spinning process, we can create this surface 
that supports a very strong solar reflectance across the solar wavelength range. And this is the white surface developed uh, by the Professor Jia Zhu's group at Nanjing University, which have a strong uh, solar uh, reflectance and in the same time, a, a good uh, thermal emission in the relative cooling wavelength range. And then uh, using that, uh, that as a baseline, we can uh, add these uh, uh, luminescence uh, quantum dots uh, to uh, create this photo energy conversion process. Here we use a proskite quantum dots as a PL calories. This quantum dots can strongly absorb uh, uh, some of these visible wave uh, light and then strongly emit uh, a remit in the PL pro process. And by using an inject a printing process, we can print those quantum dots into those fibers that's from here and create those uh, uh, paintable uh, colored surfaces and making uh, different colors and patterns here. And uh, combining with this PL process, we can see these uh, structures or surfaces have a strong, uh, have some absorption in the visible wavelength range, uh, but uh, remains a very high uh, reflectance for the rest of the solar wavelength range, right? And by putting these structures or materials under the sunlight and doing the relative cooling test, uh, we will indeed see that these surfaces with the color uh, can actually went to uh, be, uh, went below ambient temperature, uh, which means that they can uh, they are really doing a net cooling uh, in this case, uh, where the temperature uh, reach uh, below ambient and are doing uh, really a net cooling. All right, so uh, and that highlights uh, some potential opportunities by using uh, a proper uh, photon design and uh, thermal radiation design uh, where we can uh, do this uh, thermal properties control uh, of uh, surfaces. And that, that really aligns on our ability to control thermal radiative properties by properly using uh, the sun as the heat uh, source. And similar in the same time, use the uh, uh, three Kelvin space as a heat sink. And that gives us uh, opportunity for thermal management. Uh, however, uh, we, on the other hand, uh, we know that uh, we, uh, in our daily life, we use the sun not only for the heating purpose, all right? Uh, and nowadays, a large portion uh, of the work that people are doing is trying to think of how we can actually use this heat source of the sun as an energy resource for energy conversion. And they essentially to set up some heat engine in between the Earth's surface and the sun to do energy conversion. And examples including our photovoltaic cells and the solar thermal plant, all right? So uh, as we already shown that we can use the heat sink uh, for thermal management purposes. The question then is, can we also use this heat sink for energy harvesting purposes? And the answer is yes. And in the past few years, we have thought about this problem in uh, a, a number of different perspectives. And I will show you, share you some of our thinkings uh, in a different way. So the first thinking is really that uh, cold heat sink improves uh, energy conversion cycles. What does that mean is that if we look at a Carnot cycle, uh, uh, for a Carnot cycle in the thermodynamic point of view, a cold heat sink is equally important as a hot heat source, right? So if we want to increase the efficiency of a Carnot cycle, we can uh, increase, of course, the temperature of the heat source. But in the same time, we can also try to reduce the temperature of the heat sink, right? So now the, uh, if we look at the vast majority of the thermodynamic dynamic cycles uh, on the Earth, they actually dump the heat uh, into the Earth's environment, all right? Now, if we have the ability, uh, like Jordi discussed in his uh, talk, if we have the ability to use the universe as a heat sink to dump the heat, that could uh, potentially improve the energy conversion efficiency for many uh, thermodynamic cycles. As one example is actually uh, our solar cells. So theoretically, if we run a detailed balance analysis, uh, the typical uh, PV cells, as a theoretical efficiency will drop significantly if we increase the temperature. And in rea reality, if we put a solar panel on the roof, if of course we'll get heat up by the sun and reach a temperature that is much hotter than the ambient. And that will lead to a significant tem uh, temperature uh, efficiency drop and also the degradation of the lifetime. 
Well, over 10 degrees tem uh, temperature uh, increase uh, that will usually gives to about 1% absolute efficiency drop for a PV uh, cell. So uh, uh, that uh, really means that uh, it's very important uh, to, if we can lower the uh, temperature of the PV panels to increase the energy conversion efficiency. So if we look at the real solar panel, uh, we'll see that immediately these solar cells, uh, solar panels, their radiative properties or thermal radiation properties are far from ideal. Uh, in the relative cooling, uh, in the relative cooling wavelength range, uh, ideally we should have uh, broadband uh, near uh, like black emissivity to efficiently dump heat. However, as uh, a solar panel, uh, the, even with the top cover glass, its emissivity is uh, uh, far from ideal uh, due to these phonon polarity resonances uh, in the glass. Uh, in the solar wavelength range, uh, most of the cells have a very good solar absorption above band gap, which is good for PV conversion. However, they also have a significantly strong absorption that's below the band gap of the PV cell, uh, which is bad, of course, uh, that will heat up the solar cell. So ideally, one shall tailor the relative properties of solar panels uh, in this case uh, to have a, a good absorption above band gap zero absorption below band gap and uh, unity emissivity in the relative cooling wavelength range, right? So with that, uh, in uh, we have designed uh, this uh, photonic uh, relative cooler that can have a uh, near infrared uh, solar reflection and the uh, broadband anti-reflection properties in below, uh, above band gap and in the same time with a uh, strong relative cooling properties. And that leads to about six or to 10 degree temperature reduction and which translate uh, combining with its anti-reflection properties uh, translate over 1% efficiency gain. So for those of you who work in the PV, uh, especially silicon PV industry, uh, this number is actually quite a, a large number, right? So, uh, so this is really our first thinking. Uh, now, uh, as we know that uh, we have these PV cells and the solar thermal plant, which essentially uh, acts as a heat engine setting up, utilizing the temperature difference uh, between the Earth's surface and the sun. Uh, this thing works like a photon heat engine, all right? So the question then is, can we also do the similar things uh, by setting up, uh, by utilizing the temperature difference between the Earth's surface and the space? and doing a uh, heat engine in between uh, uh, similarly. The question is again, yes. So uh, we, uh, we have uh, tried it in a different ways. So the first work we have done is really a, a reverse or a, or a mirror system of a solar thermal plant. And uh, uh, in 2019, collaborating with Professor Ashras Raman, who is now in UCLA, we have demonstrated this relative cooler, combining it uh, with a, a thermal electric generator. By using uh, this radiative cooler, we can create a surface that has a, a few degrees lower uh, than the ambient temperature. And by using a thermoelectric generator, we can combine this temperature, uh, convert this temperature difference and into a meaningful uh, power generation. This number, 25 milliwatts per meter square, uh, although looks very small, but it's already uh, enough uh, to power up a small LED, which may potentially leads to interesting applications uh, for nighttime such as off-grid in uh, distributed areas where we want to do some lighting or powering up uh, small sensors. And uh, some later calculations by my colleagues and have shown that this can potentially be improved uh, to about watts per meter square level, which can be uh, a useful and a meaningful uh, number here. So this is really a mirror system of a solar thermal plant. On the other hand, we have also developed a mirror system of a PV cell where we can use as a heat sink. So if we look at a PV cell, um, uh, how it works is essentially we face this uh, a PV uh, a semiconductor photodiode to a hot surface like our sun. Uh, at the heat balance, uh, there will be, uh, in the thermal equilibrium, there will be a net photon flux uh, flow from the hot surface to this diode. Now, if we run a detailed balance analysis, and we'll see that there will be a net current uh, in the circuit uh, running in this diode. Now, uh, similarly, if we face a low bank of photodiode uh, to a cold surface, and in this case, again, there will be a net photon flux but floating from this photodiode uh, to the cold surface. Again, if we run a, a detailed balance analysis, there will be also a current 
running in the circuit. But if we plot in the IV diagram, uh, the IV curve of this case, we, we, where we call it the negative elimination, falls in the second quadrant of the IV diagram, where our typical solar cells falls in the fourth quadrant. But the similar thing is that they all can generate power, even though the negative case may reduce as the power can be uh, uh, smaller compared to the uh, positive case. So with this calculation, we have uh, actually experimentally uh, demonstrated this effect by using a low band gap uh, semiconductor photodiode, uh, um, MCT photodiode. Uh, by using this setup, we can face it to the sky. And indeed, we can measure uh, this direct electric power generation uh, using such a, a scheme. Even though the number is small, but the, uh, the, uh, from the theoretical calculations shown that it have a, a very large uh, room to improve uh, for direct power generation. And the theoretical limit of this approach is actually very similar uh, to the direct uh, direct uh, solar thermal version of this uh, energy harvesting using the uh, space as a heat sink, right? So we have sh uh, shown that we can directly uh, doing power generation from the sun. We, we, can, already, uh, we can also do it uh, by direct power generation from the space. The next question is, can we do uh, both in the same time? The question, uh, answer is uh, still uh, yes. Uh, the underlying reason is, again, this plot where we, uh, if we uh, look at this, uh, we realize that the solar spectrum and the thermal emission spectrum uh, essentially lies into two different wavelengths range, all right? And so that means that uh, spectrally, we can separate them. And uh, imagine if we build a tandem structure where we have uh, the top layer doing the solar absorbing for solar energy conversion, but in the same time, we can design the IR properties to be transparent. And in the bottom, uh, we can place an IR emitter to do the radiative cooling for energy harvesting. Then uh, we can uh, imagine a number of different approaches where we can combine solar energy harvesting and thermal radiative energy harvesting. And so with that, uh, we can compute actually compute what are the ultimate limits uh, by given this sum and the space at the heat source and the heat sink. So with that, we can actually show that the theoretical limits of really using this thermal radiation for energy harvesting can go far beyond the widely established solar energy harvesting limit. And with a number of different, many different combinations and approaches, the efficiencies can go uh, far beyond the well-established limits. And that really highlights the potential of using uh, the thermal radiation for energy harvesting purposes. So in this calculation and our previous calculations, uh, we mostly highlight the spectrum engineering. So uh, in the very last uh, part of my talk, I just want to briefly show, as uh, I already have discussed, uh, our transparency window here. But if we look at this uh, transparency uh, window of uh, the atmosphere, it's actually very uh, uh, angle uh, uh, dependent. Right, so when it's very at a very large angle, the atmosphere transparency will drop significantly. So uh, therefore, if we can develop uh, a spatially and angularly selective emitter, uh, then we can uh, actually can have the relative cooling performance it can further uh, goes uh, can be pushed to a, a further extreme performance as compared to a selective uh, emitter. And uh, so with that in mind, uh, my student Sandeep have designed uh, this uh, thermal emitter by uh, using a one-dimensional photonic crystals uh, combining uh, different uh, effects. And we can design this actually an angular selective emitter, which uh, really shows uh, an improved radiative uh, cooling uh, performances. So uh, hopefully I have sh uh, shown you a few aspects of thinking about controlling thermal radiation uh, for thermal management and the energy harvesting perspectives and some opportunities there. Um, but in general, uh, we are quite interested in the including both fundamental control of thermal radiation as well as applications and uh, the different kind of multi-scale fabrication of radiative thermal uh, surfaces and the multi-dimensional and scenario characterization of thermal radiation properties. Uh, so for that, uh, uh, for those of you uh, who are interested in this field, uh, I can point you to some of uh, my uh, our uh, review papers. Uh, one is on the radiative cooling, and more one more uh, focus on the fundamental properties of thermal radiation. So uh, lastly, uh, similarly as uh, Jyoti did, uh, I also want to briefly say that uh, we our team 
uh, even though it's uh, fast growing, uh, we're also hiring uh, different, uh, have different positions like uh, from students, uh, postdocs, and we also uh, have positions for visiting professors and uh, research faculty positions. So uh, for those of you who are interested, please contact me. So, uh, so let me stop here and acknowledge my collaborators and my team members and uh, funding support. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Uh, all right, so uh, since I'm uh, the moderator, uh, so I, I think uh, I shall uh, stop sharing my slides here and uh, we can uh, move uh, to the panel discussion uh, session and uh, uh, and save the question there. So uh, let's let me uh, again share uh, this slide here. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. All right. Uh, so let me play it here. And so uh, uh, with all the talks concluded, and uh, let's move to our panel discussion. So let me first uh, introduce our uh, panelist, Professor Lin Zhou from Nanjing University. So uh, Professor Lin Zhou is uh, a professor, uh, currently a professor in the College of Engineering and Applied Science at Nanjing University, China. Her current research interests are sustainable plasmonics, nanophotonics, and thermal metamaterials. Uh, specific research topics include random metamaterials for solar energy conversion, actually metal plasmonics, and the low powered reconfigurable plasmonics. She is currently leading the nanophotonics group in the research center of solar thermal conversion of Nanjing University. So welcome, Professor Lin Zhou, for joining us in the panel discussion. All right. Um, so okay. now we have uh, uh, everyone uh, on the stage. I think, uh, uh, can we see everyone on the stage? I think uh, we have uh, everyone here. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. So uh, uh, we can uh, thank you again uh, for joining us in this panel discussion. And thank you for, uh, especially Ivan and Jordi, for giving us this uh, uh, wonderful talks. Uh, so um, uh, maybe let me start uh, with a, a, a quick question. Uh, just out of curiosity. So uh, uh, how do you actually uh, get into this field uh, for, uh, of your research? Uh, maybe, uh, Ivan, you can start? Yes, I, actually it was uh, related to thermal dynamics. Uh, when I started to do my PhD in the group uh, here, we used to have approaches on general on thermodynamics, on statistical mechanics, and at that time there was the, uh, the the question was how to compute entropy fluxes in near field and how to use that to to evaluate uh, the the thermodynamic availability you have in. In the system, and that is why I started to to be to do my PhD on this topic here in Barcelona. So it was it was first thermodynamics, and then uh, into near field uh, heat exchange, basically. Right, Judy, you want to share some of your? <laughs> in, in my case, it was. Um... Uh, when I started my PhD, I was all interested in solar cells. I was interested in optics and light in general. Um, but I was uh, introduced to radiative cooling by uh, Professor Nan Fan Yim in, in, uh, in Columbia University. Mm -hmm. Back then, they were working on uh, silver ants. So these uh, silver ants can go into the desert at the hottest time of the day when it's too hot for their predators to come out. But they have these uh, coating on their, their back that allows them to radiatively cool and stay just cool enough to, to find food. So um, I was fascinated by the topic and uh, the fact that, like, you know, um, in uh, countries like mine, which suffer from heat, um, this can be a really exciting technology. So I uh, uh, kind of stayed on it. Uh, later on, when I joined uh, Professor Yuan Yang's group uh, formally, um, he was very kind because that topic was also very new to him. Uh, but he was very kind and supportive when I was uh, uh, like, I wanted to say I want to study this. It was new for both of us, but 
um, it, it worked out. So, so that's, that's my hand. Okay. Uh, thanks so much for the kind invitation of Professor Wei Li. And uh, so that I have, I have the, uh, the exciting uh, chance to join the, your, your talk on the uh, exciting topic of thermophotonics. Okay, uh, although I have read most of the papers our uh, speakers uh, published in the uh, previous journals, I still feel really amazing that our, uh, our speakers give rather, rather uh, impressive scientific talks on their stories. And uh, we see that our speakers show their intriguing achievement on how to harvest uh, thermal energy uh, from the thermal radiation like uh, the sun uh, or from the coldness originating from the, the uh, outer space. It is really, really interesting. So uh, uh, I think a brief uh, question uh, to Wei that uh, we know that the maximum energy we, we can obtain from the solar irradiance is about one. Uh, 1,000 watts per, per, per meter square. I mean, without external optical concentration. So um, what is the upper limit of our available energy from the coldness of the spin? And uh, one of the key parameters may be the temperature, right? Uh, could you please show more chances uh, for our young students to break through this physical limit? Thank you. Uh, thank you for that, Joe. Uh, uh, this is a, a great question. So uh, uh, we actually, yeah, in the we actually had did, did uh, this kind of analysis uh, in the past few years. As you mentioned, that in uh, solar energy harvesting, the in total incoming uh, solar flux is about uh, a thousand uh, watts per meter square, right? Uh, for uh, a single junction cell, uh, that limit is uh, uh, usually like the shock equator limit, uh, nearly thirty three percent. Uh, and that's uh, typically our most of the PV uh, people uh, are pursuing, right? And uh, if we do some tricks uh, like using uh, TPV or in using even more exotic uh, uh, non-reciprocal systems that can go to 85% and automated to 93%. But that's, I think that's uh, very far. <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that needs a lot of work. Uh, for the... Uh, uh, for the uh, outgoing uh, or the radiative cooling, uh, the uh, the total, if we think about a black body, a radiative cooling, uh, considering a uh, temperature uh, at 300 Kelvin, a black body uh, emits uh, a heat uh, about uh, 450 watts per meter square. Uh, so this number actually is uh, uh, not that small compared to the solar, right? It's uh, nearly half. Uh, however, uh, considering the atmosphere, uh, uh, if we consider the some the atmosphere transparency window and the downward radiation from the atmosphere, uh, the net cooling number uh, will be reduced around to about one hundred and fifty, uh, and that's from by many calculations uh, in uh, from Jody and uh, many other peoples, uh, depending on the atmosphere conditions, but. Uh, uh, that's roughly around this number, 150. Some people say 130 or 100. Um, yeah. So that's the heat flow, not heat flow. Uh, but if we consider this uh, energy conversion, uh, uh, what, what I described in this energy harvesting part, the theoretical limits uh, for this uh, uh, called black body limit, uh, if we do not consider the atmosphere, it's about uh, 55 watts per meter square. Uh, in, and uh, if we consider the atmosphere, it's uh, reduced to uh, one third, so uh, roughly around uh, uh, fifty, uh, somewhere between fifty, uh, fifteen to twenty, uh, uh, which is uh, of course much smaller than PV. Uh, but uh, I think uh, in some scenarios uh, it is still meaningful. Uh, for example, at night, right, uh, where we don't have PV. And uh, uh, on the other hand, if we have the ability to combine this with uh, solar. Uh, then, uh, because those two, as I uh, briefly mentioned in the talk, those two, uh, in principle, uh, uh, do not uh, conflict with each other. So, in principle, it can be stacked. So, uh, that uh, will give us a, a potentially higher energy conversion. And if we have the ability to, for, uh, this is all based on the 300 Kelvin calculation, but if we have the ability to further uh, 
increase of the temperature, then this outgoing thermal radiation uh, in terms of the power and numbers uh, will be significantly uh, increased. Uh, so yeah, I hope this, uh, uh, I'm sorry for the so long question, but anyway, I think our audience will really appreciate from the long uh, 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 results from Wei. Thank you so much again. Okay, for uh, Jyoti, I still have a, a very interesting question for you. I remember that you show us a very impressive timeline of the relief cooling de development. Right. We remember there are two great nature science papers from Shanghui and uh, uh, Zhaobo's group. Right. Um, but it is still for me, it's a uh, really, really uh, intriguing uh, uh, achievement for uh, from you and uh, uh, Yuan's group that uh, you have de developed the, the scalable and uh, 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 a really sustainable uh, 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 design for the already cooling, right? So, um, a really uh, a small question is that uh, I, I I know that your material employed in your science paper is the PD, PVDF, right? The porous PVDF material. This is quite simple from the uh, uh, the the leasing, um ion battery community. So I'm not sure whether it is just accidental uh, 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 findings or there are some other story behind it. That's a, that's an excellent question. So uh, as I mentioned previously, I first learned about radiative cooling from Professor Nantan Yu, and uh, I then moved to Professor Yuan Yang's group and he mainly does batteries. I and uh, I, um, I, learned about phase inversion uh, in, a, in a different uh, paper, but like, I was just interested in chemistry in general because I think compared to what we often do in clean rooms or in like, you know, solid state physics, chemistry actually helps us make things at a much larger scale. So I was always more bent towards that. But yes, you are very much right. The, the PVDF, the reason why we use PVDF, uh, and we were very lucky that it, it worked out, is because PVDF was the only polymer we had in our lab because all my other colleagues who did batteries, battery work, <laughs> used PVDF for their work. Um, I did not have any other polymers to work with, so it, it worked out. And actually, they use phase inversion as well. So um, uh, I was I was really excited by the, the possibility that, like, you know, when I what I did mention in the talk is that paints are limited in terms of their reflectivity because of the white pigments they use. The white pigments actually absorb in the invisible solar wavelengths. So the solution at our end was, okay, why don't we just get rid of the pigment and just leave air voids that can still scatter light. Um, so the fact that like, you know, we had phase inversion to draw from and the fact that it ended up being a paintable process was really um, uh, a very happy combination of circumstances and I'm very grateful for it. Okay, thank you. So interesting. Oh, finally, I, I, I think I uh, would be uh, 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 very grateful to uh, Evan's talk. Uh, we know that it, uh, the non-reciprocal management of light or electrons are of fundamental importance and applicable uh, 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 application uh, pot potentials uh, in the field of photonics and electronics. And um, as so we know that understanding and the control of heat are much more limited with respect to the their photonic or electronic counterparts. So I'm just curious about uh, what is uh, what the initial motivation uh, for you uh, that you just uh, uh, lonely uh, uh, persistent focus in this field. Yeah, because uh, I compared to the I mean compared to the photonic or electronic uh, counterparts, it is rather rather. Difficult, yeah. For me, yeah, yeah. Uh, no, just um, as I said before, I started more for a from a fundamental point of view, studying statistical mechanics and just curiosity, and then uh, moving to to this field. Uh, uh, at the end, uh, it combines. A lot of uh, theoretical concepts, which are very interesting uh, with a very profound uh, 
physical significance, and also they are close to uh, very concrete realizations, uh, as for instance, those uh, explained by Wei and Yoti before. So it's a, it's a, it's a topic that uh, actually, for me, in my opinion, eh, is uh, very appealing uh, uh, from a theoretical point of view, but uh, it's not just theory, but it, but it's it close to reality. There are some potential applications with uh, important impact. So at the end, uh, this is why I like this uh, this field actually. Mm. Oh, that's great. Um, a very short question. I I mean for even that. Uh, I also noticed that the uh, the thermal rectification. Um, uh, by the pyroelectronic system can also harvest energy of about uh, uh, 100 milliwatts per centimeter square. Oh, it is amazing, really. So uh, could you please just uh, briefly talk about the key parameters that may determine the upper limit of the harvest energy? Thank you. Uh, the harvesting uh, using the pyroelectric uh, device, uh, the, the key parameter is uh, basically this uh, is the... the the pyroelectric activity of the material. I mean, if you use uh, this kind of harvester, uh, so this is something intrinsic, uh, an intrinsic property of the material. You need to have a pyroelectric material uh, working in a the good uh, temperature range and with a high pyroelectric coefficient. It is the pyroelectric coefficient uh, what uh, dominates uh, the, the the behavior. Uh, this uh, regarding uh, uh, this uh, energy harvesting devices. Okay, like thank the, you. The, the pyroelectric coefficient of the material. Okay, okay, just. So, by the way, way I I I, I remember another uh, uh, small questions from uh, from your talk. I remember that you uh, you conducted the. Uh, 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 the the radiative uh, thermal management uh, uh, in the silicon uh, PV cell, right? And uh, mm -hmm. finally, you obtain like uh, one percent uh, efficiency in promotion. And mm -hmm. I mean, is it the EQE uh, or the system efficiency promotion? Uh, that efficiency is the uh, the total PV energy coming. It's the power efficiency conversion. Uh, Power conversion efficiency. I see. I see. Thank you. Uh, and just to uh, maybe, uh, I saw uh, one question from the chat box. Uh, oh. uh, let me briefly read this question. So the the question is: uh, the mid IR black body emitter usually needs to work at higher than five hundred Celsius to have a proper efficiency. Is it possible to make an efficient mid IR light emitter? By designing a special surface so that the radiator can work at a much lower temperature, yet remain a high radiation efficiency around mid IR band. Uh, I'm not sure I fully understand this question, but uh, uh, I think maybe this question can goes to Professor Lin Zhou, as I know that uh, uh, your group and the Professor Jiajiu's group is doing some uh, this uh, high temperature emitter designs and uh, uh, works. Okay, yeah. yeah, we 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 do have some works on the high temperature, uh, mm -hmm. uh like selective absorbers for solar thermal PV, and for these uh, uh systems, the uh, material stability is uh one of the key uh problems. Yeah, um, and the metal surfaces sometimes suffer from the uh poor uh. Uh, high temperature stability, and uh, uh, I remember that I have a, a, a material case like use a uh, 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 few layer uh, thermal emitters with uh, extremely sharp uh, thermal emission, uh, like the near infrared, mm -hmm. like the uh, in a near infrared wavelength. Um, but uh, but uh, uh, even though uh, we have a, a very uh, delicate design. For from the spectrum size, but, but uh, once we put it into our setup, uh, I mean the high temperature uh, setup for the STVV, uh, the overall efficiency is still really, really poor. So um, 
uh, uh, I, I mean that it is still a, a, a huge space for the improvement, but uh, uh, it, it, it is rather challenging. I mean, it is still rather challenging in the future. Okay. I see. Thank you. Uh, yeah, maybe I just maybe uh, just to uh, add up on this uh, question is uh, uh, I think as Professor Lin Zhou uh, discussed uh, from the at high temperature, the material stability is a very uh, big challenge uh, that I learned from uh, previous uh, uh, discussions with many groups. Uh, this is a this is a very difficult test, uh, not only for solar TPV but also for uh, TPV designs and these things because. At high temperatures, uh, the materials stability uh, is uh, 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 is very diff uh, difficult. Uh, but uh, regarding this question, uh, maybe one uh, uh, one uh, side note adding to the answers is that uh, uh, I, I guess the question uh, the, uh, the question is trying to see if we can still uh, design a surface that uh, uh, can work at a lower temperature. Uh, but still have a high uh, radian, uh, radiation efficiency around mid-IR band. Uh, I think uh, at mid-IR, uh, uh, it might be possible because the, the uh, black body spectrum covers this wavelength range, right? Uh, if you do, a, uh, if you do a, a, a low temperature or room temperature emitter, you can still have this uh, uh, mid-IR uh, if you're referring this mid IR to uh, 10 microns, then that's definitely yes. But if you are uh, referring this mid IR to three to five micron, uh, that's a bit difficult because uh, uh, the thermally populated photon energy uh, uh, it doesn't have much in this uh, three to five, right? As most of the energy is spent in the uh, from five to 20 and peaks around 10. Uh, but uh, uh, there are uh, also some uh, uh, theoretical uh, proposals nowadays trying to think about uh, if we can using uh, either chemical potentials of uh, photons uh, uh, to uh, significantly increase the apparent temperature of the emitter uh, uh, by adding uh, positive chemical potentials or uh, using uh, time modulated systems to do some uh, efficiency, uh, uh, photon energy conversion from to convert from relative lower photon energy to uh, to higher um, uh, higher photon energies. So uh, that uh, might be possible. Uh, so, uh, Jordi, you have questions for Ivan? Uh, is, is that right? Yes. Regarding the last uh, point, you were mentioning also this is a good uh, strategy to increase the temperature and overcome the the the, the gap. Uh, the, the problem of the band gap, so the possibility because the, the band gap uh, actually uh, spoils the behavior because you need high energy photons, and then by using the uh, 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 doping with the uh, uh, diode, and then would result in something uh, an improvement. Now, I I, I had all, I, I also think that there is a very interesting strategy to combine both cooling and energy harvesting at the same time. So as you were mentioning, way because there's a, actually uh, cooling is, is very important when we just want to cool down things, but also we need to cool down to, to improve the efficiency and also, as you properly mentioned, to, uh, to convert and eh, to, to, to gain uh, useful energy. So this is a strategy of combining both I think it's a very interesting uh, path. And also, I had a question uh, also from uh, Jyoti's uh, uh, talk regarding the adaptive uh, emitters. You mentioned something that they are uh, at, at the end. This was not it was not clear to me. How uh, you can uh, get uh, uh, adaptive emitters? I mean, uh, is so you work out. A property in the material that uh, changes with uh, temperature, for instance, and then uh, is something passive on the material, or is adaptive because you have to um, uh, do some action on the emitter. So, yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, 
um, but the quest, the, the problem is that the emitter and the absorber is so close to each other and so close to the base PV cells. So, uh, that, that is the key point. And uh, you, you have to recycle in the, 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 the photons inside the, the closed uh, system. And the, you, you, you only have like, uh, less than one millimeter or even smaller gap. So, so that is the key point. Yeah. Yeah. I, I guess Ivan also have that question for Jordi, right? Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I perhaps should have clarified it a bit more. Um, so there are, uh, as opposed to static radiative coolers, which have a constant um, reflectance or emittance at all times, you can either have a dynamic system which you tune actively. So that can be electrochromic, for example. Uh, that you have to charge so that that's an active system or fluidic uh, so you can change the refractive index within the medium by inserting fluid um, so those are active systems and then there are thermotropic systems that are adapt to temperature so you can have uh, phase transition materials like vanadium oxide for example or other thermotropic materials that can switch from like you know metallic to insulator states or from uh, like uh, color like you know materials that change from the black to white uh, depending on the, the type of material that you're looking at. but uh, And then you can always play with um, uh, some of the more notable works that have come with come up recently in science. There was a paper published from Barclay. Uh, they basically involved uh, micron-sized nano uh, microstructures, arrays of microstructures whose metallic state is in fact the emissive state because of the way like you know the the, uh, the microstructuring is done. And when it's in an insulator state, then the underlying um, a reflector that you have basically plays the role of the, the reflector. So that ensures the low emo. So there are, like in summary, there are two types, active and, and passive. And thermochromic, I would say, is the passive. Mm -hmm. Good. Nice. Thank you. Great. Yeah. So, um, so uh, yeah. Uh, just maybe just to follow up on the previous question that Professor Lin Zhou uh, asked uh, Jody, uh, that reminds me of something uh, I wanted to ask Professor Lin Zhou as well, because uh, 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 we know that you have, uh, uh, you and Professor Jia Zhu have worked on this uh, sodium based plasmonics uh, as a novel materials uh, for, uh, for plasmonics uh, and photonics. Uh, so, similar question to you is that does that inspiration also comes from a different disciplinary, say like a battery or different uh, field, or uh, that comes out of? Uh, uh, yeah, 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 exactly. That that uh, uh, this uh, is a very interesting question. That uh, actually this. Just very similar uh, or, or uh, similar case. Uh, we have the chance to deal with the uh, alkaline metals uh, just because uh, uh, in the in 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 our group that we we have uh, uh, many students uh, do with the nitrate uh, nitrate metal batteries. So uh, so so an accidental accidental experiment. Uh, our students see that saw that the the melt the the molten uh 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 sodium metals uh just looks like uh really uh bright appearance. Uh, it inspire us to uh, to think about uh, the physical origin of this uh, phenomena, and then we uh, we as ascribe the uh, bright appearance uh, of the sodium metal to the low optical uh, loss, uh, and then and we. Just uh, persist uh, to pursue the low optical uh, uh, damping of the plasmonic metals. And that is the the story. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, all right. So uh, we have. Do we have any other uh, questions or things? Uh, um, I I had one question for you, Wei, uh, oh. <laughs> and that is to do with the the photonic uh, stacks that you showed. So one mm -hmm. question that I have is like you know often the, the optical properties of these stacks mm -hmm. are are uh, angle dependent, right? So a, a bit like butterfly wings, they're irid they can be a bit iridescent, like depending on what angle you're looking at them, the color changes. 
uh, but it may not always be the most uh, like you know desirable solution if the color changes from your depending on the angle of view so but i i do think that there have been advances made in doing angle independent uh, mm-hmm. like you know uh, photonic properties so could you mm-hmm. please uh, like uh, elaborate or let us know your thoughts on this yeah quick question so uh, I, i think uh, if i'm right i think you are pointing to this uh, colored uh, uh surface right this multi layer stacks right yeah so uh, uh let me try to answer this in a few different uh, aspects the first is uh, uh in this uh, design uh, specifically uh we actually taking into this angular effect into consideration when we design it uh so these two structures uh their temp- uh, angular dependence is actually quite weak uh uh is because uh, uh, they are, uh, uh, from our understanding, that they are partially absorbing. So uh, we know that if it is only uh, like a, a bandpass f- uh, tr- uh, filter, then it's very temperature uh, angular dependent. But when you add absorbing medium into it, uh, then this dependency uh, can be uh, uh, in a way, in some way, uh, to be reduced. So those two structures are actually not that. Uh, 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 angular dependent so uh, there there's a spectrum uh, design we actually have that into account and and second is uh, 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 you are right uh, this uh, uh, there are now many approaches uh, uh, to do this uh, in uh, to try to do it in this angular independent fashion uh, in terms of this uh, uh, film stacks uh, when we do it we actually try to uh, also try to to do it on these uh, uh, rough surfaces, uh, say like uh, we, at that time we tried uh, on doing it on this uh, unpolished uh, silicon wafer. So uh, that uh, those rough surface surfaces uh, somewhat uh, average out these uh, angular properties, and in the end the uh, deposit surfaces uh, they are just like a normal, uh, you know, like like uh, typical surfaces. So. Uh, uh, so I think uh, indeed there are uh, different ways, and uh, later work uh, as we showed the uh, collaborating with Professor uh, Jiazhu's group uh, using different um, uh, uh, material uh, systems, and then this uh, angular uh, dependency will uh, yeah will naturally be uh, removed. So I'm, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but uh, um, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Okay, and are there any other questions? Um, uh, if uh, if not, um, perhaps we can uh, conclude uh, our uh, panel discussion. Uh, so uh, thank you all again uh, for uh, joining the panel discussion. Uh, so to really close out this uh, session, uh, something I have to do is to uh, give uh, uh, each uh, give us uh, speakers as a certificate uh, to thank uh, their contributions uh, to use talks. Uh, so uh, the first one uh, gives, uh, goes to uh, myself, <laughs> which, uh, uh, right? So, uh, but uh, for me, I would say just uh, uh, thank you uh, for ICANX uh, for this platform uh, to, this is a really uh, a wonderful platform for people uh, sharing, especially for uh, young scientists to sharing their works and, and uh, to, uh, discuss and uh, and uh, uh, promote uh, and uh, uh, share their perspectives. Um, so and also I want to thank uh, 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 Ivan, uh, Jordi, and Professor Lin Zhou uh, uh, joining me uh, in this today's uh, session. And so uh, uh, our next one uh, certificates uh, goes to Professor Ivan Latella from University of Barcelona. Uh, for his talk, thermal management and energy conversion with near field thermal radiation. Uh, thank you for joining us and give us uh, this very simple talks. Thank you. Um, and next certificate goes to Professor uh, Jyoti Mandel from Princeton University uh, uh, for his talk in relative cooling of terrestrial uh, objects using space as a heat sink. And, uh, Thank you very much, Shorty, uh, for giving us this wonderful talk. And uh, I really heard a lot of uh, new perspectives, especially uh, from the environmental uh, 
and the civil engineering uh, side, which I think for most of us, which uh, on the photonic side, uh, those things uh, have not been uh, really uh, considered. And I really hope to see uh, more uh, uh, results uh, from from your side <laughs> later. Uh, all right, thank you very much. Mm, all right, so uh, finally, finally, I also want to thank Professor Lin Zhou for joining us in the panel discussion and uh, uh, with uh, all these uh, sort of provoking uh, questions and discussions. Uh, and I really enjoyed all the talks and uh, uh, discussions. Uh, all right, thank you all uh, very much. So the one last thing I have to do is uh, to uh, to show that next week, uh, we will, uh, next Tuesday, we will have our next uh, use talks uh, focusing on um, intelligent soft materials and devices uh, from a number of uh, uh, experts in the field. I already see some familiar faces uh, uh, in that uh, uh, in this area. Uh, so uh, next uh, will be these talks will be happening on June six uh, Tuesday again uh, on eight p.m. Beijing time. So uh, uh, thank you again for joining us uh, today, and thank you all for our speakers. And panelist, uh, thank you, uh, the organizer IKNX, uh, to make this uh, wonderful platform. I hope to see you next Tuesday. Uh, bye bye.不是奇迹，不再是幻想，此刻正感觉全世界离我鼓掌。不必太在意身旁惊奇的目光，可以点点头，可以放声歌唱。我创造奇迹，我拥有梦想，我希望看见所有骄傲的脸庞。再为曾经失败放弃或感伤，努力才是真的方向。I can, I can， 没有什么可。